Good evening and welcome to another edition of the Savvy Street Show. Um, today we are doing a different segment, a segment that a series we're going to start on philosophy and psychology. Uh, we are going to continue our segment on the deep state, but today's segment is an introduction into the series on philosophy and psychology. We have a special guest again tonight. His name is Dr. Brian McQuay. And let me tell you his bio, it's very impressive. Brian McQuay received his MA and MS from the University at Albany, State University of New York, and a PhD from Princeton University. He works as a licensed mental health counselor and is a scholar on China and Japan, where he has lived and taught for 16 years. Now, he also taught at the University of Arizona for 10 years. And we have quite, quite the prolific author here. Brian has authored 16 books and the subjects as diverse as pop culture, politics, education, religion, nationalism, history of psychology, and archaeopsychology. Quite a multidisciplinary scholar and our topic today is the theories of Julian Jaynes, who was quite the sublime multidisciplinary scholar. So, so we have the right kind of guess. Um, Dr. McQuay's latest publication is in press and it's called The Self-Healing Mind, Harnessing the Active Ingredients of Psychotherapy, which combines his interest in human adaptability, both through history and therapeutically. Welcome to the show, Dr. McQuay. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Okay. Um, now, before we delve into the world of Julian Jaynes, which um, scares people sometimes, confuses people, and for most people, it's quite a novel theme, I just want to explore a couple of things, if I may. First is the word consciousness, which most people associate with a blow to the head and you become unconscious. So if I may, we're dealing with consciousness, by which we mean an ability to form and retain the self and identity through narrativized time so that I know, you know, I grew up on a farm and my parents were always on the farm. That was me. Now it's me doing this. And then in the future, my plans are, well, when I get to 65, I want to retire or I want to become a medical doctor at 25 and so on. So the formation and identity of the self in narrativized time, plus the ability to introspect and know that an introspect and daydream and to know that it is me who is daydreaming or me who is introspecting. Does that cover the concept of consciousness that we're talking about? Yes, I think um, that's actually not a bad description. It sounds like a, a, a description that Jane's would agree with. Um, there are perhaps a, th a few other features that could be thrown in, but basically I think you um, uh, gave a good definition. And I think what's important when we try to understand what Jane's meant by consciousness is to look at what he did not mean by consciousness. And the problem, at least in the English language, is that the word consciousness has four or five very different meanings. For example, uh, getting hit on the head and being unconscious or being asleep and then waking up and being conscious or being in a coma and lacking consciousness. Uh, consciousness for many people also means perception. And that is something that James did not mean when he used the word consciousness. For many people, the word consciousness means thinking or cognition. And that's not what James meant by it. Of course, these things are related and in a certain sense entangled with a Jamesian definition of consciousness. But he is looking uh, for, uh, uh, he, he, he was using a definition that actually was uh, quite uh, precise. And so in any case, I, I think it's very important to start any discussion on uh, what James meant by consciousness by clearly talking about what he meant by it, because people do get very confused. Okay, thank you for elaborating on what it is not as well as what it is. Um, so I didn't do a bad job. That's good to know. 
Um, now, I want to start with a phenomenon that fascinated me when I was a teenager. Uh, my mother was a teacher at a medical school, and I used to go there because they, one of her students was a stage hypnotist. And I was, as a teenager, badly wanting to, I was fascinated by it. I was wanting to get into a trance. <laughs> and I never did. I used to, every time a hypnotist, stage hypnotist asked for volunteers, I would be one of the first ones to go up on stage. <clears throat> and I didn't get hypnotized, but I, I would then enjoy the show. And I knew from some of my friends and also my mother's student who was well known to me, that they didn't plan to, the occasionally they may have planted a shill in the audience, but they didn't do so as a regular feature. There were people within minutes were told, for instance, to clasp their hands, and then they were told they are stuck together, you can't move them. And you know, they, they were sort of trying hard and they couldn't. And it was, or, or there were occasions when people were given a pretty sour lemon or a leaf of spinach told it was delicious Swiss chocolate and it appeared that they really thought it was very delicious how do we I mean how is it that the sense of self goes away so quickly and these people are not brain damaged people they're people from ordinary walks of life they haven't been hit on the head they haven't been given any drugs just like that in a minute or two they become somebody else and are following orders. How does that happen? So I think it's actually a good maneuver on your part to bring up hypnosis um, in order to understand Jamesian theory, because James devoted an entire uh, chapter to hypnosis. And what's important about James is in one fell swoop, one fell theoretical swoop, he explains how hypnosis, other psychological anomalous behaviors such as glossolalia, spurt possession, how these all relate. And no other theorist has done that. And I think that's why Jane's um, is so important. But to get back to your uh, original question about what is hypnosis, what's going on there. So hypnosis is, is fascinating because actually we studied. We have studied hypnosis for many years. We know a lot about hypnosis. Hypnosis is used in uh, in clinical settings for uh, hypnotherapy. Nevertheless, we really don't understand why hypnosis occurs. It's in, in that regard, it's quite mysterious. We know a lot of the details. We've done a lot of research, as I said, on hypnosis, but it's not supposed to happen. It's not supposed to be so easy to suspend someone's sense of agency. And yet, apparently, that's what happens when someone is hypnotized. And of course, there's a lot of variation. Some people are more easily hypnotized than others. But nevertheless, most people can be hypnotized to some degree. They can enter a trance state to some degree. So what's going on there? And James argued that the reason why people can be hypnotized is because what happens is when someone enters a trance state, certain features of consciousness, such as a sense of agency, a sense of, of narrow of time that is uh, uh, in a narrative form, um, uh, so these features are erased temporarily or suspended temporarily. In other words, certain features of consciousness. And what happens in a certain sense, an individual's mind returns to uh, an earlier mentality. Of course, they do not ever completely return to this earlier mentality uh, that James called uh, the, the bicameral mind. Because once you have that information in your head, on what it means to be consciousness. That's always gonna be there. You can't get rid of that. But consciousness is a very flexible thing. It's basically based on language. And if you're able to verbally induce someone into a trance, then you gain not control over the person. Uh, of course, if someone does not want to do something when they're hypnotized, of course, they can always stop. 
but nevertheless, there's a certain facilitation that occurs when someone is hypnotized. So in any case, that, uh, that, that, that's just sort of a, there's a lot of things that Jane said about hypnosis, but uh, for Jane's, it indicates that the human mind is much more plastic than we uh, have believed. Okay, now I just want to clarify, you said the mind goes back to an earlier mentality and by earlier we mean here, I think, archaeologically earlier, not regression to when you were two years old, although some stage right. shows do that, you know, imagine right. you're four right. years old and then people talk, start talking in gibberish or they write like 40 year old, 40 year olds and so on. So the mind is regressing to a mentality that existed thousands of years ago, essentially. In a, sense. in a certain sense. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, of course, it's not. Because as I said, once someone has learned to be conscious, they're always going to be conscious. Um, but I think the way to look at it is consciousness is just a thin layer on a much uh, deeper mentality. And that layer, it's, it's not as, um, well it's easier to strip back that layer of consciousness than we thought. And when you do temporarily strip back that layer of consciousness, then you see what James called the, what the bicameral mind was like. And so you're not literally going back, of course, um, to a, an earlier mentality. Um, you're just in a sense, changing the language, if you will. And that makes it easier to command people and to control people. Of course, just to clarify, it doesn't mean you can ultimately control someone when they're hypnotized. It just means they're more likely to go along with your suggestions. Um, and the idea is that your uh, reality for them becomes more flexible. And, you're, and the hypnotist creates what is called uh, uh, paralogic. So there's, in other words, if you tell someone who is hypnotized to walk across the room and if there's a chair in front of that person, but you tell them there's no chair, the person simply goes around the chair. And then when they come out of the hypnotic state, you'll ask them, was there a chair in the room? And they'll say, no, there was no chair in the room because a paralogic reality was introduced while they were uh, hypnotized. Okay, very, very fascinating. Um, so I think that's a good platform to delve now into the four interrelated um, theories of Julian Jaynes. Can we do that? Sure, sure. So Jaynes actually uh, did not uh, offer you know, one theory about the mind. Um, he actually offered uh, a number of different theories or concepts. And he himself came up with this, uh, this framework of four hypotheses. And I think it's very important, uh, and I'm glad that you're approaching it this way, because some of the misunderstanding uh, around Jaynes is that he, his ideas, his theories cannot be tested. And that simply is not true. You just have to have some imagination, good research methodology, and you can test his theories. And of course, if you want to do that, you have to propose, well, what are the theories in the first place? And as we've already mentioned, as you mentioned, we can begin with four key hypotheses. And actually, these hypotheses can be broken down into what we can, what I might call uh, sub hypotheses. But in any case, the first hypothesis, I think, is the problem. I'll start with the, with this hypothesis because I think it's easier. I, I think it's the the least controversial. It's one that most people uh, would agree with, and that is that consciousness, the way James defined it, is based on language, uh, a certain type of language. It's based on metaphors. And if that, that, this hypothesis actually, it's not that difficult to show if we do uh, some sort of analysis of history. And in, in fact, in some of my work, that's what I try to do. I try to look at ancient languages because if James is correct, before people became conscious, which was about 
3,000 years ago. And actually, just let me footnote, especially for, for anyone in the audience uh, who's, who is new to Jains, for, for what the, the, the key notion for Jains is that consciousness is not genetic. Consciousness is, did, did not arise or emerge because of evolutionary changes. Rather, consciousness is something historical. It's something that, that comes through culture. More specifically, consciousness is something that comes through language, that you have to, uh, the only way to become conscious is, uh, is through um, uh, learning certain words, certain concepts, and these concepts, of course, lead to consciousness. But in any case, to get back to what I was saying before, you know, if, if that's the case, we can look at ancient languages and the, rec the record is a bit spotty. It depends what language you're looking at, but certainly uh, we do have enough texts. We do have enough records to test what James claimed. And basically the hypothesis would be that uh, before about a thousand BCE, languages lacked mental words, or we might say that languages lacked a psychological vocabulary that described things such as uh, thinking or introspection. Um, the, 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 language, the, the language would be very behavioristic. It would basically only describe people's actions. Now, there may be some exceptions, of course, um, and it's very difficult sometimes to interpret the text. But from what I've seen, when you compare these ancient languages, what James claimed pretty much holds up. And he actually came up with uh, uh, four phases that languages go through as they develop a psychological vocabulary. I don't have to go into that right now, but I just want to mention that so we understand that there's nothing abstract about this. And, and in Jane's book, for those of pe for the people who have read Jane's book, um, they'll know that he spent a lot of time looking at the uh, 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 ancient Greek language and how that evolved the vocabulary of mental words. But as I said, if you look at ancient Egyptian, if you look at uh, Akkadian, Sumerian, um, Chinese, uh, you can see the same development from a language that was not psychological, that lacked mental words, evolving into a language that became uh, more psychological. So, you know, in other words, the word I and you know, self-reflection did not exist in multiple languages in a world that wasn't as connected by trade as, as it is today. So you know, one language might have lacked those words, even though the phenomenon phenomenon existed. You know, it was just a lack of words, less a lack of richness in that language. But when that happens in multiple cultures, in multiple languages, independent of each other, that's strong archaeological evidence in support of the fact that language gave rise to consciousness. And the way we define the consciousness, I think of it as well, if we are introspecting and we don't have the tool of language and we want to talk with ourselves, we want to reflect on things, what can we do it with? It, it's like trying to play the drums. You may be an expert drummer, but you don't have the drums in front of you. So what do you do? Uh, you got to right. have the language. Um, and the language, in fact, is, uh, you know, every word in a language is a concept other than proper nouns stand for something. So we need concepts with which to talk to ourselves. So if we didn't have those concepts, if we didn't have the language that expresses those concepts, we could not introspect. Is that a fair summary in a, in a logical sense besides the archeological evidence? Yes, and so uh, two points I'd make in response to what you just said. And uh, one point, and this is very important, um, if, if what James, if what James argued is true, you will see this in all language, in all ancient languages. Um, you, you will see the same pattern. And in fact, that's an important point uh, to make concerning other claims, other theoretical claims that James made. Does it apply to just one or two ancient cultures or does it apply to all ancient cultures before about a thousand BCE? Of course, there's some variation. And the, to the best of my knowledge, 
all core civilizations fit into a Jamesian pattern. And this is true not just for language, but for other, uh, other issues that have to do with what with, with he called um, bicameral mentality. So that, that, that's an important point, because if, if that's not true, if it only applies to one or two cultures, then the theory doesn't work. But I have yet to find any exceptions. And that's why, personally, I, I think there's a lot of uh, evidence to what James um, had to say. And uh, actually, the, the second point I was going to make, I, it, it just slipped my mind. But uh, in any case, um, I'm sure it'll come back to me in a second. But um, uh, yeah, so that's the, that, 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 that's, uh, that, that, I think that's a, a very important uh, point to make. In okay. fact, in my writing, I come, I come up with, a, it's a bit pretentious, but I use the term um, bicameral civilizational inventory. An inventory okay. is a list of Jane, what we would call Janesian features uh, that have to do with the bicameral mentality. And uh, so I call it bicameral civilizational inventory hypothesis. So it's a hypothesis. And so it's a little challenging to gather the evidence, but it can be done. And uh, I won't go into detail on, on the, the tonight right here, but um, and I, this is something that I've been working on. You know, the idea in science is to try and disprove the theory. And so far, I have not been able to disprove, uh, I have not come up with evidence that goes against what I call the bicameral civilizational uh, inventory. Oh, that's, that, that is interesting and excellent. Now, I, I did want to make one point. You said consciousness, as we defined it, the ability to know we have a self and the ability to introspect is not genetic. And for the sake of the viewers, I, I think it's akin to saying it's not like puberty, which is a biological phenomenon. It, it isn't there when you're born, somewhere around the age of 11, 12, 13, 14, you, a normal healthy individual will just go through that without right. any language or external influences. On the other hand, what we're saying is um, consciousness is not automatic. So let me, let me posit a, a time travel experiment. Um, or, or in fact, instead of a time travel experiment, which in which a, a baby born today is taken back 3000 years to live in different times, I believe there are cases of children brought up in the wild by animals. They survived for a few years. They had no linguistic skills at all when they were brought back into civilization at the age of eight or nine. And one would have to posit at that age, those children would not have had a self-reflective consciousness because they had no language. Is that correct? Probably. That's probably true. Yeah. So to do a, a thought experiment, if we could go back in time, say 4,000 years ago, and snatch a baby born in Babylon or wherever, and somehow transport that infant to our present time and raise that infant, that infant, because of linguistic socialization, absorbing metaphors, absorbing metal, uh, mental language would become conscious. At the same time, if an infant were born in our present era, and would somehow we could transport that infant three, 4,000 years ago, when that child uh, would be socialized, they would not be conscious. They would be, uh, by, they would have a, develop a bicameral mentality. So, um, so that's an important uh, uh, explanation, uh, uh, an important illustration to show what James meant when he made the claim that consciousness is not an evolutionary given. It's not genetic. It's, I think, a good way to look at consciousness. It's sort of like mathematics or a technology, inf uh, knowledge about a technology. That is something we're not born with. Um, that, uh, for example, how to design uh, uh, buildings or spacecraft, uh, whatever, that is something that is socially developed, and that applies to consciousness. And that is that's sort of an intellectual hurdle 
that's difficult for some people to, to get over because we have a sort of folk psychology where we associate consciousness with perception and we associate consciousness with something innate or inborn. Um, but in fact, James, of course, argued against that. And, and he, looking at the historical records, made the claim that there's no evidence that people had consciousness the way we think of it until approximately 1000 BCE. Okay, um, maybe time for us to jump into the second hypothesis. Sure, okay. So this second hypothesis is a, a more controversial, I, I, I think. Um, and this is, uh, um, this is, um, well, I'll, I'll just call it the bicameral mentality. And the idea here is that if people were not conscious, what type of mentality or what type of psychology did they have? And of course, James uses the word bicameral. Bicameral, of course, uh, is actually a political science term. It means two houses or two chambers. And James argued that if you look at the brain, it actually has two chambers, right hemisphere and left hemisphere. And that instead of having a sense of self, instead of having uh, uh, personal volition, people, when they confronted some novel situation or they were under stress, when they needed instructions, they would hear the voice of their ancestors, the gods, uh, perhaps a king, some supernatural entity that would tell them what to do. So in a nutshell, that's what, uh, uh, that, that's the second hypothesis. And like I said, that's a, that's a little more challenging to demonstrate, but there is a lot of psychological, excuse me, a lot of archeological uh, evidence. Because if you look at ancient civilizations before about a thousand BCE, they all talk about supernatural visitations. They all talk about communicating with the gods. Um, and it gets a little complicated, the, Jane, his, his explanation as to when uh, this sort of bicameral mentality developed. Um, but basically he makes a claim that th this, this ability to hallucinate voices was a side effect of language. And uh, let me just can I stop you one place sure. there. Um, you mentioned the voices of gods and supernatural voices. So it was in fact the individual's own voice. Yes. That they believed to be, you know, the voice of gods or whatever. James, right. as far as I know, was an atheist, despite being the son of a minister. And these individuals did have in the center of their brain, a corpus callosum. Anatomically, they had the network to, to connect the right hemisphere with the left, if, if you will. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so actually what we're talking about now, we're sort of moving a bit into the, another hypothesis, which sounds similar to the second hypothesis by chemical mentality, but the other hypothesis is um, bicameral neurology. In other words, what is the exact neurology that subserved bicameral mentality or bicameral um, uh, psychology? So they, they overlap, they sound similar, but actually there, there is a difference. Um, and the reason why is because the evidence that we would use to demonstrate hypothesis two about bicameral mentality, that evidence is gonna be different from the other hypothesis about bicameral yeah. neurology, which of course the evidence would come through uh, neuroscience, um, but they're basically going in the same direction, this idea of the, the bicameral mind. Um, but um, in any case, in, you know, the thing we have to keep in mind about uh, uh, the second hypothesis, uh, and of course, Jane spent some time in his book talking about this, is the development of bicameral mentality. So it's a little bit sketchy, but uh, the idea is that originally, probably before the agricultural revolution, about 10,000 uh, BCE, 
people lived in small groups, uh, per, uh, small clans, and uh, they perhaps um, when they needed to accomplish a task, they, uh, because they had no analog eye to narratize for them, if they had to, uh, for example, uh, chip away at a stone tool, they would uh, hallucinate a voice. Where the voice came from or who the voice belonged to was irrelevant. What's important is they were given an instruction to stay on task because they weren't conscious yet. They had no sense of time, uh, had no sense of, of, of personal timeline. Uh, and, and well, what happened eventually is that that voice would be attributed to a leader, perhaps the clan leader, a, a chief of some type as societies started to become bigger. Um, the, the, the voices would be assigned to, as I said, some sort of ruler. And then by the time you get to 4,000, 3,000 BCE, the voices are being assigned to the gods. Um, and so basically it, it took maybe six, 7,000 years of uh, development uh, to go from a type of hallucination that was very simple, that was just a voice in your head telling you to do something. And again, it sounds odd to us because we're so used to the idea, if I hear a voice and no one is there, I want to know who that voice belongs to. But that's a modern way of looking at things. And we have to remember that Homo sapiens going back 10, perhaps 30,000 years of uh, BCE had a completely different mentality. And they simply would not ask those questions. It would not be relevant to them. And again, that's, I know for some people that's difficult to uh, accept, um, but in any case, um, that's just some uh, commentary on uh, hypothesis two. The reason why I, I, I talk about this is to uh, add a little nuance and complexity to what James had to say and to show that he did think these things out. But whether one accepts or agrees, of course, with James' theories, of course, is another question. But what's important is that he spent a lot of time trying to uh, figure out how bicameral mentality, where it came from and how it uh, evolved. Okay. So, so this in, in the bicameral neurology, we had a situation of historically, I guess, they were all command and control societies throughout history. And a sense of agency was put into the human early in life, where it was tribal elders or later on voices attributed to gods and religion, etc spoke to them and they thought it was them, you know, they had to obey them. And even today, the sense of agency that some people have, I mean, Eric Byrne talks about, about that in Games People Play and then Thomas Harris, two psychiatrists also did that transaction and analysis. They say, we have a component of parent and adult and a child and parent is all the admonitions and you know the to do's and don't do's that came from society, teachers, religion, parents are all embedded in you know ingrained in you. And when you develop a fully functioning adult, that's when you just don't act on those embedded agencies. So in a sense, we don't have real free will until we realize that that voice, even when we introspect, and that agency belongs to you know, our parents or teachers or religion, and we can overrule it. Until yes. then, there isn't a big difference other than the old mentality. I think the right brain was hallucinating to the left or, or giving auditory instructions to the left or vice versa. Right. Uh, yeah, the, the, right, um, the right hemisphere would concoct the uh, hallucinations and okay. then convey okay. it to, to the left hemisphere. Okay. And there's some evidence of that occurring, say, today in schizophrenics, for instance? Yes. Well, in fact, uh, the, the hallucinations experienced by schizophrenics is um, another part of the, another piece of the puzzle, as it were, that James tied all together. You know, so we, again, it's one of these things that people have not really thought about deeply. Why is the human mind 
able to hallucinate in the first place? I mean, it's too pat an answer to say, well, well, they have a few wires loose. It doesn't make sense. So the fact that schizophrenics, uh, in fact, not just schizophrenics, but in the non-clinical population, there are many people who hear voices and are not diagnosed with a mental illness. So this, this is actually a much more common phenomenon than uh, many people know. Um, in fact, there's a, uh, uh, there, there, there's a whole movement, international movement, voice hearers, people who hear voices and want to come to terms with why they're hearing voices, but they're not necessarily diagnosed as being schizophrenic. So to put it simply, what I'm trying to say is, uh, in quotations, normal people also hear hallucinations. Uh, so what's going on? And of course, Jane's made the argument, well, it, it's because the uh, he used a special term, aptic structure, that the brain is born, excuse me, that, that the brain has in it these aptic structures. The brain is designed to hear voices. And that consciousness was just a way around that. As societies became too complex, we had to go beyond uh, bicameral hallucinations. Um, so, um, yeah, th th this, uh, you know, the, the, to, uh, to get back what I, th th what I was saying, th th I'm glad you brought that up, this idea of um, how schizophrenic hallucinations fit into all this. Okay, thank you. So we've covered, I think, three hypotheses. First is the, um, how consciousness arises, you know, the ability to in introspect and have a sense of self in narrativized time arises because of language. Uh, the neurology itself of the bicameral mind and the old, how far back were we a bicameral society and how it, uh, you know, how it made advances and existed in fact. Mm -hmm. So what's the fourth one? So the fourth one, we've, the fourth one uh, is uh, when did consciousness emerge? And of course, I've already mentioned it, and the dates are approximate. We're talking; it depends on the 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 the, the place. There is some variation, but overall, a uh, thousand BCE is is a good date. Um, and again, this is uh, for some people very controversial. Um, to the reason why it's difficult to imagine, many people find it difficult to imagine entire societies, advanced civilizations that functioned without consciousness. But in any case, we, a part of this hypothesis that we're talking about, when did consciousness emerge, is why did consciousness emerge? And this is very important because everything we, we've been talking about really doesn't make much sense unless we uh, address this issue, why consciousness emerged. And it had to do with, uh, ironically, the success of bicameral civilizations. And what I mean by that is bicameral civilizations became very, um, the, 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 the populations increased, the demographic scale increased. This made their civilizations much more complicated politically, economically, and they started to break down and a new mentality was needed. Homo sapiens had to upgrade its mentality. And there are different ways that a species can improve its lot. And one way is through genetics, which of course uh, evolution is a very slow process. But for Homo sapiens, there's another way, which is through culture. And basically about a thousand BCE, we saw these massive changes in civilizations. And again, this is where we have to be a little bit careful. It's not as if a, uh, a switch was turned on and everybody woke up one day and they were all conscious. Consciousness, th th there were precursors to consciousness going back as far as maybe 1000 BCE. In other words, th the roots were there in the culture for consciousness to develop. And in, it, in his book, and people overlook this, these parts of his book, but James does mention what we can call transitional mentalities, where people had one foot in the bicameral world and another foot in the conscious world. And so this was a gradual transition that took place over centuries. 
but probably by around 1000 BCE, maybe 800 BCE, consciousness is well established. And again, uh, as I said, a lot of uh, the, the, the reason why, to put it simply, is because societies had become too complex. A new type of psychology uh, was needed. And uh, in the same, you know, I, I think a good way to look at consciousness is uh, mathematics. Why did mathematics develop? I mean, the type of mathematics that quantum physicists use, that other researchers use today, that type of mathematics is in a completely different world compared to the mathematics, for example, that was used uh, in Mesopotamia, 2500, 3000 BCE. Um, it, I mean, if you look at the uh, mathematics that the ancient Egyptians used, in some ways it's quite impressive and sophisticated, but it is not the type of mathematics that started to develop in, in the 19th and 20th century that, that we're used to. And consciousness acts, is, it, it, act, it functions in a similar manner to mathematics. The more complicated, the more scientific, the more technologically advanced, the bigger a society becomes, you're going to need a, uh, um, advanced mathematics. It's the same thing with consciousness. You're, you're going, as societies become more uh, complicated, more convoluted, as they scale up in size, you are going to need a psychology that is suitable to deal with all that complexity. So if you, you know, speculating on that, if you had a society that was less complex, even today, I mean, maybe a spear throwing tribe, if you will, and if you research them, would you find some vestiges of the bicameral mentality? And you, you've done research in China and Japan for, I believe, 16 years. Have you found some evidence that, you know, their transition, for whatever reason, was delayed? Um. Well, I think in all societies now, no matter where you go, you're going to find vestiges of, of bicameriality. Um, I think in smaller societies, especially what we might call tribal societies, they're probably conscious, but you'll find more vestiges of uh, bicameral mentality, but you'll find it everywhere, even in the modern world. And, you know, Jane's talked about how even a church is a vestige of the bicameral mind, this idea of house of God, yeah. um, whether it's uh, a temple or a, a synagogue, a mosque, whatever it is, these are all in a sense houses of, of, of God. Um, and so in a very vague sense, that's sort of a vestige of, the, of, bi of uh, bicameral mentality. But I think there are more dramatic examples of uh, vestiges of, of bicameriality. Uh, such as spirit possession. And in fact, that was uh, my PhD dissertation. It was on spirit possession in Japan. Um, and anywhere you go in the world, well, hypnosis itself, of course, yeah, yeah. That, that, we uh, that we we introduced this discussion with um, is a vestige of uh, uh, bicameriality. Uh, glossolalia, um, uh, the uh, imaginary companions of children, uh, I, I would never claim that all children, when they claim they have an imaginary companion, um, are uh, experiencing hallucinations, but I think some are. I think that, that some, some very young children uh, actually do have visions and hear voices when what, they're very young. At what age do we uh, develop a classic selfhood and the ability to introspect? Because by the age of two, children are talking few words, but what age is their, you know, temporal transition in that sense, not historically? Um, that's, uh, that, that's, that's an important question. Um, I, I, I'm not sure myself, but I, I would say certainly by the age of seven, young children are, uh, are going to have the core features of consciousness in place. And there'll be some variation. Um, and, you know, it's very, another important part of Jane's argument that people unfortunately overlook is that when he talked about consciousness, he listed about half a dozen different features 
So he was very specific in what he meant by consciousness. So consciousness is a package of mental capabilities. And I've expanded the list to about a dozen different capabilities when I, uh, just through my own research. But in any case, the reason why that's important is because each individual will become conscious on his or her, in his or her own way. Um, and to give you a simple example, uh, the ability to use your mind's eye to visualize what you had for breakfast, for example, or, or where you were on your last vacation. Some people can do that very, very well. Some people um, can really call up vividly and describe in detail that, that type of mental imagery. Other people, they can do it, but they're not that good at it. And then there are some people who cannot do it at all. And so even in the modern conscious world, you're going to see a lot of variation when you measure these different features. Um, another example might be to narratize, self-narratization. Some people are very good at that. They can tell you what, what they did last week, day by day. And some people can even go back further. Other people have a more difficult a time trying to do that. So these, all these different features come together in, in a different way for each individual. Okay. Um, we've had a, a fairly long introduction. It's difficult for people, but I have time for one last question in this session. Sure. Um, earlier on in, in informal discussions, we spoke about Ayn Rand and you said her philosophy, if I remember correctly, opens the door to infinite possibilities. Uh, and I sense sometimes James wasn't that much of a fan, perhaps, of his own discovery of, of in, a, in a sense that, you know, of the great ability that introspection confers on us of agency, of, of free will, and that opens the door to infinite possibilities. So would you say that this is a fantastic technological development that has occurred for us? And it has some profound implications, the way it occurs in children and the way it occurred in the past. It has some profound implications that we don't have time to explore today, but has profound implications for uh, archaeological research, developmental psychology and the philosophy of mind. Yes, uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's a very interesting way of looking at it. So if you look at the great uh, inventions, the, 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 the so-called revolutions that uh, act as milestones of uh, human history. We talk about the agricultural revolution. We can talk about the invention of writing. Uh, urbanization was another great invention that changed the, the face of the world. Um, by the time you get up in, 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 into the, uh, the, the 15th, 16th centuries, you're talking about exploration, using new technologies to explore the globe. Um, <clears throat> and of course, by the time you get into the enlightenment, you're talking about scientific discoveries, 19th century, the industrial revolution. Um, these all changed what it means to be human. And there's kind of a, a problem that some people may have, you know, what does it mean to be human? And some people, I think, are very comfortable with this idea that to be that, that there's a human essence that does not change throughout history. Now, what that essence is, I don't know. But I think another way to look at it is that the human condition is, is evolving. It's constantly changing. And that's easy to see when we look at technology. It's a lot more challenging when we talk about abstract notions like, like consciousness. But I think if we view consciousness as a type of technology that comes through language, a type of knowledge, we can see therefore that consciousness is a great human invention, as important as the agricultural revolution, as important as the industrial revolution. It certainly changes the way we view our relationship to the universe. It, how we relate to other people and how we relate to ourselves. So um, I, I certainly would, um, uh, and, and you know, I've, I've been speaking in very grand terms and we don't have time tonight to, to talk about it, but 
you know, one of my interests is to take Jane's definition of consciousness and look at the psychotherapeutic ramifications and to try and understand how to improve psychotherapy by using a Jamesian definition of, of consciousness. So, and the, the reason why I, I mentioned this is because I think some people view Jane's as an eh, interesting idea, but can, you can't really prove it. It's about, you know, these dusty old civilizations that have gone the way of the dinosaurs, but that's a very mistaken view of Jane's. Jane's is relevant for our present. Jane's is relevant for, your, for our future. And I think there's a whole basket of ideas that James presents us with that have not really been tapped or developed yet. And in, in that sense, James was a psychologist. He was a very humble man. But I think that James should be viewed. James is probably turning in his grave when I say this. But I think James, if he had lived longer and wrote more, would have actually taken a more philosophical uh, turn. And uh, certainly, I think that personally, I can read a lot of great ph philosophy into Jane's. Um, but in any case, that's just my own opinion. Okay. Well, thank you. And we, we'll certainly bring you back, Dr. McVeigh, to explore some of these things in okay. the very near future. So um, thank you for being with us and making, you know, giving us a splendid introduction to the very, very complex world of uh, the theories of Julian James. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And I'd uh, love to uh, continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. So um, bye for now. And we'll be back uh, in a few days. Thank you. Okay. Bye for now.